standing class is number 405, Ebony Scrat. The entry of Mr. and Mrs. Vernon McGee of Atmore, Alabama, and Billy Gray is riding 405, wins the class. Like your horse tonight, Billy? Yes, sir. I thought he was a great horse. How do you do at the celebration? I I didn't have this horse at the celebration. I got him after celebration. He was second there with another trainer. I see. Uh, you're going to bring him back, I'm sure, in the uh, stake. Bring huh? him back Friday night. Uh, what What do you think the horse is capable of? You I, think he's capable of I think next year he can be the world's grand champion walking horse. And you're getting to work on that right now? Work huh? on it all the winter. I just didn't play as well as I did last year. Just didn't get the breaks. And the putts didn't go, so it's just what happened. Show me this. <laughs> what happened? Well, it was a sort of a freak accident. I was playing football at Disney World on the beach uh, Wednesday before the tournament started. And uh, I fell over a lounge chair and fell on my wrist. I'm um, going to the doctor right now to see what it, what's it all about. Mm. And you went on and played? Yeah, I played. I played in a pretty good deal of pain, but uh, a doctor taped me up pretty good. And, uh, I seem to get by pretty good. I made a few eagles and a few birdies, helped my partner out every now and then. <laughs> and, you, and you told him, you got to do it, guys. I'm, I'm injured. Huh? I told him, I said, I'm going to leave you one leg a lot, so you're going to have to play real good. And how'd you do? Uh, we tied for eighth. We did oh, very well. I, you know, he, he made every putt you inside 50 feet. breaking the other arm? <laughs> well, I thought about breaking his, too. But yeah, I think if I'd have putted a little better, uh, we might have won the tournament. I, I hit some pretty good shots during the week. I made a few eagles and a few birdies and helped him out. but. Uh, he really carried us. He he made he played the par three so well, and he made about, I guess, six 40 to 50 foot putts during the week. So that just really helped us out. Our rule reads that if a school either by NCAA action or SEC action is forbade from taking place and or taking part in a NCAA television program or NCAA postseason football game. They would lose all sources of revenue from that uh, particular funding, and uh, this would include Auburn now under the present situation, and anybody else who's involved after the rule was passed in '78. Well, in the event they got probation without sanctions, how would that? It would not affect the uh, that aspect of it. The reason for the rule was that if an institution could not participate in a bowl game or participate in the television program, they were bringing in no revenue and yet taking out revenue. And so consequently, uh, that was the thinking behind it. The, it's an automatic penalty, but it has appellate procedures which one can go through in order to reduce that penalty. But to give you some idea of what we're talking about in terms of money, uh, if an institution could not take part in the television program or in the bowl game, that would, on an average year, represent roughly a quarter of a million dollars. For most kids, tomorrow night is one of the biggest nights of the year. And in some areas, it's also a big night for pranksters. Officials with Montgomery's Youth Aid Division say the pranks aren't really a big problem here, but parents should still be aware of the possibilities. Well, they could put razor blade, candy, and if you had a, you know, hypodermic need, you could shoot some type of drugs, you know, maybe into it where you wouldn't, I wouldn't readily see it. So that's really, you know, the parent need to examine it prior to, you know, kids eating it. Sergeant German says if you can't go along with your child, send him out at first dark and have him come back at a set time. Also, only send your child in a neighborhood where there are people you know. And when he gets back, check all treats before they're eaten. Some other good advice has to do with your child's costume. There are all types of masks and costumes to choose from, but whatever you decide, make sure it fits safety regulations by providing openings in the eye, nose, and mouth area. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News. Evans says the new criminal code has taken away the power district attorneys need for white-collar crime prosecution and says the old statutes need to be reenacted. And above all, a greater commitment to fighting white-collar crime is needed. We need a total commitment from somebody who stands up and says, we're going to do something about governmental corruption. Yes, we're not afraid to establish a special prosecutor's office in the governor's office. Evans, who prosecuted former Public Service Commission President Juanita McDaniel, also had some comments on the PSC. And we're not afraid to bring consumer representation to the Public Service Commission. 
by allowing every district attorney in this county and funding him for it to intervene and give him the right to intervene in every uh, utility rate increase before the Public Service Commission and give him the right to represent his constituency, create the Office of Consumer Protection for Utility Consumers, and put in that office a man who is elected statewide. Evans says fighting white-collar crime is expensive and can't be done effectively without sufficient funding, which he says is a low priority in the legislature. Dan Black, WSFA TV News. Ethics Commission Chairperson Bester Bonner suggested several general areas to strengthen the state's ethics law. One grants the commission subpoena power. Another would correct inequities relating to the filing of financial disclosure statements by political candidates. Mrs. Bonner also suggested to make it a misdemeanor instead of a felony for failure to file and to reduce the maximum punishment for violation of the law from 10 to 5 years. Meanwhile, some Sunset Committee members would just as soon Ethics Commission members keep their personal opinions to themselves, especially pertaining to the use of state aircraft by Governor James and his family. Senator Finas St. John says he can't understand why, after determining that no state law prohibits the governor from personally using state aircraft, some commissioners claim it's wrong. Senator Richmond Pearson claims the Ethics Commission is on the spot to issue an advisory opinion on legislators employed in education voting on education-related legislation. George Mitchell, WSFA TV News. These Halloween decorations are just one of the license office's reminders urging area businesses to pay their renewal fee by tomorrow. If the business has been in operation for the past year, a license application has already been sent to it. But for new businesses, there's a different procedure. Now, you will not receive an application if you were not in business last year. If it's a new business, then you have to come in the first time yourself. Those who miss the license deadline will be penalized with a 15% late charge. And I issue a warrant, and the sheriff's department serves the warrant, and then a day in court is set aside for them, which the district attorney's office trying my cases for me. Renewing a business license costs between $1 and $375, depending on the type of business. The money goes to state road building and to the special education fund. Jane Matheson, WSFA, TV News. Well, now I tell you why, because uh, he's a small bone. I believe he's going to take that thing off Friday uh -huh. for the uh, Alabama State game. So, you expect it, him to play then? I expect him to play. And then, too, they got about six or seven quarterbacks who are fine quarterbacks. And, uh, you know, we, we tried to get one, the Miller young kid, it was from, from uh, Lee. Alabama State coach James Oliver is hard at work these days. The Hornets opened the season in five weeks, and gone are four starters off last year's NAIA runner-up team. ASU advanced to the championship game last year before falling to Cameron on television. Alabama State has reaped great benefits from that national exposure a year ago. Getting a, a player of Lewis Jackson caliber, Melvin Armstrong, and uh, Fred Freeman, a kid we got from Jefferson State Junior College, who led his team to second place in the National Junior College Tournament last year, really helped. And, you know, you just can't beat that kind of exposure. Uh, people have a tendency to, to look when they want to read about you, and it's very easy when they're able to see you on the television. The Hornets have but one senior on the squad, but what a player Kevin Loader is. District 27, Player of the Year in 1979. First team NAIA All-American, first team NAIA All-Tournament team, and a 22 points per game season average. 
He started off, uh, you know, doing real well, and uh, he's going to continue. He told the guys over there in practice, he said, I'm the only senior on this team, and if you take my shirt tail, I'm going to lead you. So he's doing a good job with that right now. Aside from Loader, Oliver is looking toward his younger players and transfers to keep the Hornets on a steady course to the national title that eluded them last year. I always set that goal for him, and I try not to set an unrealistic goal. Dave Cody, WSFA TV Sports. I think Wendell's best wide out of the nation myself, and I think Bond is going to be a great quarterback because uh, he is only a freshman, and they've uh, won six games and have uh, close to 400 yards. Uh, I think the way the sticks are uh, offense per game, and and uh, every play starts with the quarterback. So uh, they've been, but that's not the only football player they have. Don't forget that they. They have, as a matter of fact, I think, and I said this early in the year, that uh, they have football players, that, that three or four teams, is only, there's only three or four teams that have many football players as they have. How about your team? They've improved, I think, a great deal in most areas. Uh, they'll never be where I'd like for them to be, but I'd like for them to be where, I, I'd like for our defense to be where it is now. I think it's. Not with depth wise, but it's pretty good now. And our offense has improved so much, but we have still have so many injuries, and we have to move people around, have people play in two positions. And, and last year, of course, we had uh, a great offensive line that, mm -hmm. that uh, we probably may never may never have one that good. But uh, overall, we could we still have a lot of room to improve. But we've improved so We keep improving. We'll be a good football team. Plans are currently being made to build a plant in Prattville that will manufacture uranium pellets, which will be used to fuel nuclear power plants around the world. What will this fuel fabrication plant mean to you? I'm Chris Grimshaw, and beginning Monday on the 10 o'clock report, I'll provide some insight into both sides of this controversial issue. I'll take you on a tour of a similar plant in South Carolina and show you what effects it's had on that community. Prattville's nuclear pellet plant, power or poison? Part one, Monday night at 10 on TV 12. Plans are currently being made to build a plant in Prattville that will manufacture uranium pellets, which will be used to fuel nuclear power plants around the world. What will this fuel fabrication plant mean to you? I'm Chris Grimshaw, and tonight on the 10 o'clock report, I'll provide some insight into both sides of this controversial issue. Plus, I'll take you on a tour of a similar plant in South Carolina and show you what effects it's had on that community. Prattville's nuclear pellet plant, power or poison, part two tonight at 10 on TV 12. I'm Chris Grimshaw. Join me tonight at 10 for a close look at Prattville's proposed nuclear pellet plant and the effect it will have on you tonight at 10. Plans are currently being made to build a plant in Prattville that will manufacture uranium pellets, which will be used to fuel nuclear power plants around the world. What will this fuel fabrication plant mean to you? I'm Chris Grimshaw, and tonight on the 10 o'clock report, I'll provide some insight into both sides of this controversial issue, continuing our investigation of the risks and regulations surrounding this type facility. Prattville's nuclear pellet plant, power or poison, tonight at 10 on TV 12. According to Montgomery City Code, it's illegal to post or paste political advertisements on utility poles, fire alarm poles, trees on city streets, or any other city-owned property. City Attorney Bernard Brannon says a penalty for such an act is six months in jail or a $500 fine. But Brannon says it's hard to enforce this law because the individual who put the signs up is responsible rather than the candidate. And Brannon says that's difficult unless you actually catch the person in the act. A state regulation regarding this issue is one handed down by the Public Service Commission. 
That law places the responsibility in the hands of the utilities by ordering them to remove all political posters attached to utility poles. The Commission's reasoning behind this is that the signs create a danger to employees of electric and telephone companies. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News. Important votes that Alabamians will be casting next week will be for the president of the... This area, if you will note, comprises those states that are served by the Southern Company corporate structure of which Alabama Power is a subsidiary of. And I think by coming together and comparing the information that we have as regulatory agencies, we will be better able to inform the public of what is truly going on in the matter of electrical generation and delivery within the respective states. And see what we can accomplish. We've got to make every effort good conduct. We've got to subscribe to those standards, live by them, and ensure that the It's been a difficult week to prepare for a football game, but with all the talk of Doug Barfield's future and the NCAA hearing, which happened this morning in Colorado Springs, Colorado. But from all indications, practices have gone extremely well, and the consensus seems to be that a little more concentration and effort will turn the near misses, such as occurred at Mississippi State and LSU, into touchdowns and victories. An area of concern is sickness and injury, though. Several frontline troops are down with the flu, and some still have nagging injuries from last week. Well, you know, everybody's kind of getting older now. Got a little rest the last couple of days, and I hope to have everybody well. We hope they are. And the injury problem is not that bad, huh? Yes, sir. Really, you know, looking forward to the game. And a little emotions can take care of a little bit of nicks and bruises here and there. Need a victory, don't you? Yes, sir. Bad. <laughs> Landrew, the former mayor of New Orleans, was named as secretary of HUD by President Carter in 1979. Landrew says Carter will carry Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia, and has an excellent chance of carrying the state of Florida. Landrew was asked how important former Governor George Wallace's last-minute endorsement will be for President Carter. Well, we welcome it with open arms. We're tickled to death, and uh, he's a very, very popular man, and, uh, and I think is going to give us a good shot in the arm. We're grateful to him. Landry was then asked about Governor Fob James, who has not endorsed Carter or Reagan. Well, I certainly wish he would help us. Uh, I, I think he could be of help to us. I don't think it's fatal, um, but uh, we certainly could use it. I would encourage him to do so. <laughs> Landrew's next stop is his home state of Louisiana, where he will wind up the final three days of the campaign before Tuesday's election. Dan Black, WSFA TV News. It surely wasn't the homecoming queen in her court, but signs of the times, Halloween. Halloween provided the opportunity to blame the usual flubs, miscues and baubles on mischievous spirits at work. Entire teams worked to suppress those evil spirits. While punting was a bit tricky, those who had to return the ball found few treats awaiting them. Kickoff returners fared no better. Again, the players went to any extreme to find the force that had them grabbing for air. Some players absolutely flipped over the strange turn of events. For the Chargers, John Jefferson, Halloween had begun two weeks ago. So last week, J.J. was ready for anything. A touchdown treat and a few tricks in the end zone. At the Montgomery County Jail, the situation is ripe for an incident. That's what a jail consultant has determined because the jail lacks space and a secure layout. Architects say the county needs a new court and jail facility, 
and they recommend a plan that would cost $23.5 million. The plan involves building separate jail and court buildings on nearby county property with a tunnel connecting the new and present buildings. The plan would provide the required 60 square feet per inmate compared to 17 square feet provided in the present jail. Other suggested solutions to the problem involved building a 17-story high-rise in the parking lot next to the courthouse, a move that would cost more than $30 million and provide no chance for expansion, or building a court facility nearby and a jail in some other location using buses to transport prisoners. This solution, too, would be costly. Architects urge commissioners to move quickly before inflation increases costs and before the potential inmate problems are realized. Lisa Nielsen, WSFA TV News. Besides charging 30-year-old Clarence Williams with first-degree armed robbery, Montgomery police are still looking for three more suspects who might be involved in robbing City Beverage Company. The brown Dodge, witnesses described as the getaway car, was found abandoned, and police caught Williams on foot in the vicinity of the robbery. Police spokesman say Williams, who was identified by a City Beverage employee, had a quantity of money in his possession. Police also say Williams had been arrested for robbery several times before. Jane Matheson, WSFA TV News. Maybe we've had been out in front and want to run the clock more and uh, incomplete pass doesn't run the clock or maybe a field position hasn't been right. And uh, But I think we've done, uh, I, I have commas in our passing now. I think we can throw the football and we'll probably throw it more Saturday than we've been throwing. They're probably going to force us to throw it more anyway. Well, this is one of the biggest challenges we've had all year. We're playing the best football team we've played this year, and uh, I feel like it's going to be a tremendous ball game. Coach Lee? Uh, I can't find any fault with that. It's going to be a super ball game. It, it always is. I don't see why this will be any different. Uh, I think everybody's ready. You know, we've worked hard, and we're prepared, we hope, and uh, we're just waiting. You know, we're looking forward to it. I'm interested to know what you told the guys at halftime last week down, uh, what was it, 7-6? 
well, <laughs> I just begged and pleaded with them all. And coach, you had a nice time of it out here. Uh, are the guys feeling good after that win? Well, you you must be real pleased after the win, especially scoring 28 points. I think it's the first time we've had that kind of effort this year. Uh, and it's going to take a tremendous effort tonight to even get on the board. How do you feel about your opponents here? You mean in what respect? <laughs> <laughs> Coach Lee, do you share that same sentiment? <laughs> yeah, I have all the respect in the world for Coach Boswell and his team. Our boys do. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, it's going to be a heck of a good ball team, uh, two ball teams playing, and it'll be a good ball game. Uh, I just I wish everybody in town could see it. Coach, I guess you feel about the same thing. Yeah, I'm going the same opinion. Uh, come on out. We're going to get after each other tonight. Never, you never know uh, who we have in this country that... Uh, their case, I think that was what they were saying, as I recall. And, and uh, so that I would say, yes, that with the food, uh, the food strike as such, you're uh, refusing to eat. Can identify men. So I think what, what I'd caution you about, Lisa, is that... that uh, uh, Mr. Resto can answer you know, specifics, but uh, I'd, I'd ask that you not ask him to give opinions about what the refugees have said to see if it, if it jives, because that puts us on the spot. The first three amendments will have statewide impact, even though it won't be listed that way in the voting machines. Amendment 1 allows farmers to develop programs for research, education, and promotion of peanuts, cotton, and milk. The programs will be financed by the farmers and will be administered by nonprofit associations. Number two provides that certain population bracket laws enacted after any population changes as a result of the 1980 census will remain valid. Number three would give the legislature the authority to authorize the termination of alimony when the spouse receiving it remarries or lives openly with the opposite sex. This amendment won't affect child support. The remaining four amendments apply to individual counties, but everyone will be allowed to vote on them. Amendment 4 would give the legislature the authority, with Escambia County residents' approval, to set court charges and compensation for county officials. The Lee County Commission would be able to establish firefighting districts if number 5 is passed. Number six deals with a change in the language on ad valorem taxes for Mobile Countyans. And Amendment 7 gives the legislature authority to set court charges in Sumter County. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News. The ruling makes the utilities responsible for political posters attached to utility poles and orders them to remove the signs. South Central Bell spokesman Tom Somerville says the ruling is basically designed to help avoid safety hazards. Anytime you attach some foreign object to a telephone pole, you can create a hazard that people climbing the poles can slip and fall down, could be seriously injured. So uh, we are very much in favor of the ruling and we very much appreciate uh, people abiding by it. Somerville says work crews take the signs down as they come to them. He says they don't assign crews to go out for the express purpose of removing the signs. Somerville says the utilities really have no way to prevent the signs from being posted, but says if asked, they quickly tell the candidate or campaign workers no. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News. Leaving your child unrestrained in the front seat of a car leaves him vulnerable to America's number one child killer. Holding an infant on your lap is no improvement. 
Alabama public health officials say the most effective method of protection is a child restraint system used in the back seat of the car. If parents would use safety restraints, that is the approved variety, uh, statistics have shown us that they could reduce deaths by as much as 91 percent and injuries by as much as 80 percent. The government approved variety of child restraints have strict structure requirements and have been subjected to dynamic testing. Parents should be very careful when they're purchasing restraints or seats and make sure that they are properly constructed. Now one way they can do this is to look for a label that says that they meet the uh, specifications of Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard number 213. This uh, label will be very prominently and conspicuously displayed on the restraint. They should also make sure that the restraint is not the type that simply hooks over the seat back or slips up uh, underneath the seat. They should also make sure it's one that, that you use in conjunction with the safety belt system. Although children may find the restraints confining, parents can teach them to enjoy safe riding by entertaining them and stopping frequently on long trips. Jane Matheson, WSFA TV News. Randy Stratus is one of three professional chimney sweeps in Montgomery. Usually this type of work is only a seasonal profession, but Stratus says he's starting to work year-round now that more people are buying fireplaces and wood-burning stoves. One question he's asked quite often is what type of wood is best to use. He says if you use pine, you'll have to clean your chimney more often because the pine builds up more criso. He says the harder woods stay hotter longer. As far as cleaning is concerned, Strata says it all depends on how often you use the fireplace, which should be once a year if you use a cord and a half to two cords of wood a year. There is potential danger there, but it's not dangerous if they maintain it properly. If, they'll, if they have an airtight stove, we'd like to encourage them to burn that stove hot at least twice a day. And by that I mean opening the dampers up at least twice a day to let their chimney get hot. This will help with creosote buildup. Be aware of the fact that wood-burning stoves are much more efficient, build up a lot more soot and creosote in the chimney, which could cause a chimney fire. Strata says everyone should be aware that a chimney fire can spread and burn a house down. He says homeowners should take the responsibility of cleaning the chimney or call a chimney sweep to do the job. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News. In an attempt to protect their young during car accidents, Rhode Island and Tennessee have passed laws requiring, in some instances, the use of child restraints. A bill similar to Tennessee's law was introduced in Alabama's last legislative session, but it died in committee. The bill is written so that, uh, right now, so that it would not require uh, your children uh, transported in my car to be restrained or my children transported in yours. In other words, it would only apply to 
my own children and your own children. It also would permit uh, parents or adults to lamp hold children, which is a very dangerous thing. Although the Tennessee law contains some loopholes, state police have an effective way of enforcing it. Tennessee police are presently carrying restraints in their cars, and when they stop um, a motorist, they will uh, show them the proper type of restraint to buy, and they will also lend the restraint to the motorist so that they can put their child in that restraint. They're also requiring the motorist to purchase a restraint when they show up in court to uh, pay their fine. The Rhode Island law is more extensive than Tennessee's, but neither state requires the child restraints to be carried in the car's back seat. And the Alabama bill will go through some revision before appearing before the upcoming legislative session. Jane Matheson, WSFA, TV News. In the next two hours, these contestants are going to try to beat last year's record by eating more than 30 hot dogs. This year, many professional feasters from all over the U.S. turned out for Bob Harmon's contest to eat their way to a $1,000 prize besides the winner's plaque and crown. The former record breaker successfully gave it another try. I think I probably ate a little bit faster last year. I'm not too sure, but um, I would say eat slow. It's two hours long, and you're going to be here a while. How are you doing this year compared to last year? I'm way behind everybody right now. Perseverance paid off, and Holton reclaimed his title as hot dog eating champ by devouring a whopping 33 hot dogs. Jane Matheson, WSFA, TV News. 23-year-old Anthony Jerome Smith has been in and out of jail since he was 17. He's been found guilty of several criminal acts, including first-degree theft as a result of nine burglaries in Montgomery, and he was convicted of homosexually assaulting other inmates in the Montgomery County Jail four years ago. Now, under the new Habitual Offenders Act, Smith becomes one of the youngest persons to receive a life sentence. When the jury returned a verdict of guilty on this defendant, Anthony Jerome Smith, um, the state moved to have him treated as an habitual offender under the new criminal code, section 13A-5-9, and Judge Gordon agreed. We presented evidence of four prior felony convictions on this defendant, and uh, Judge Gordon sentenced him according to the law, sentenced him to life in the penitentiary. Kim Davis, WSFA, TV News. Next week, some of you will go to the polls to take part in the process of naming the next president of the United States. But when you vote, even though you pull the lever next to the name of a presidential candidate, you aren't really voting for a president. You're actually voting for a group of presidential electors who will gather in the state capitol on December the 9th and vote for a president and a vice president. And all of Alabama's electors are going to vote for the candidate who gets the most votes here in the state of Alabama. What this means is, that if 49% of us vote for candidate A and 51% of us vote for candidate C, all of Alabama's electoral votes will go for candidate C. Candidate A gets nothing for his 49% of the Alabama vote. The Electoral College was first used to elect a president back in 1789 after being developed by our founding fathers at the Constitutional Convention in 1787. Back then, news and information traveled very slowly, and most of the people were poorly educated. So our founding fathers had very little confidence in the will of the people as a whole, and they developed a system that left the heady decision of naming a president to a select group of men they felt were wise and just. And from this system, the Electoral College as we know it today evolved. In recent years, the system has come under a great deal of fire, but to date, Congress has resisted all efforts to get it changed. People opposing the Electoral College charge that the system is unfair because of a built-in imbalance of power in voting. In some cases, for instance, an electoral vote in one state carries four times the weight of an electoral vote in another state. For instance, there are 12 states containing only about 20 percent of the total population of the country that could name a president even if every voter in every other state voted for a different candidate. Those states are Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Illinois, Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Missouri, North Carolina, Texas, and California. In other words, if a candidate carries those 12 states, he wouldn't have to worry about 80% of the American people in the other 38 states because he'd win the presidency with just those 12 states' electoral votes. Defenders of the system say that won't happen, and they point out that the apparent imbalance is actually the factor within the system that balances out the population difference between urban and rural areas. 
Another charge has been made by critics of the Electoral College. They say it's possible for the American people to elect one candidate and the Electoral College to put the other candidate in office. And they point out that's already happened three times in our country's history. Tomorrow night at 10, we'll look at those three elections. Skip Haley, WSFA TV News. Earlier this week, presidential assistant Ray Jenkins said here in Montgomery that he and others are gravely concerned that the Electoral College could put the runner-up in the White House this year. In 1976, as a matter of fact, had 10,000 people in just two states, Ohio and Hawaii, voted the other way, the Electoral College would have put Gerald Ford back in the White House for another four years, even though Jimmy Carter would still have had the most popular votes. And three times in our nation's history, this has actually happened. In 1824, Andrew Jackson received over 43% of the popular vote. His opponent, John Quincy Adams, received only about 30%. Under the Electoral College system, the whole thing was thrown into Congress for a decision. And in 1825, it was John Quincy Adams, the runner-up in the popular vote, who was sworn in as the sixth president. Then in 1876, over half the voters in this country named Samuel Tilden as their choice for president. But the Electoral College selected runner-up Rutherford B. Hayes, despite the fact that he had received less than half the popular vote. In 1888, it happened for the third time. That year, Grover Alexander was the choice of the people, but the Electoral College selected Benjamin Harris. And in 1889, it was Benjamin Harris, the runner-up, who moved into the White House. Proponents of the system say this was all a long time ago, and it's just not likely to happen in modern times. Critics like Ray Jenkins say that not only can it happen, it would have happened in 76 except for 10,000 votes, but that it might happen next week. People favoring the Electoral College say that attacking the college is like attacking the Constitution itself, and they say it served us well. One thing both sides agree on, it's most likely to happen in a year that the popular vote is very close. And one thing most of the pollsters agree on, next week, the presidential election is still too close to call. Skip Haley, WSFA TV News. The names of dead and insane voters appear on most voter lists in Alabama. State election officials say large numbers of dead voters are certified by registrars and published in local newspapers in most areas of the state. In one recent city election, one family spotted the name of a relative who had died more than 20 years ago. It was reported to the Secretary of State's office. In, in many counties, in and on many poll lists, the names of dead people in duplicates, people who either moved from county to county uh, or moved out of state, or in some cases they've simply moved from the municipality to an outlying area in the county, but are still on the municipality's voting list. And some of the complaints that we have received are that either somebody has voted who, who is not alive any longer or moved out of state uh, for as long as 20 years in some instances, or people are being allowed to vote in municipal elections who are no longer residents of the municipality. Even though it does sound uh, trivial, I think we could correct a great many of our election problems if we could simply clean up our voting list to eliminate dead people and duplicates and people who've committed felonies or people who've been declared non-compass menace. 
We've had other complaints of a woman who's, who said her father died 15 years ago, yet he's still listed on the newspaper, in the newspaper that's published before the, uh, before the elections as being a qualified elector in Alabama. Sigelman also says the potential for vote fraud world is world compounded by another problem. Yeah, but yet there is no happen, so. central oh, system. There is no uh, file maintenance system for the state. There's no way that we can compare, say, Montgomery County's voters list to Autauga County's, to Elmore's County, to, to Houston County, to see whether or not there are duplicates. We can only surmise from several uh, studies that have been made, one by the, the uh, United States uh, Judicial System for the Middle District, which took a survey of 22 counties and found that in some cases as, as much as 48 percent of the mail which was sent to the registered voters came back as being undelivered as addressed. In our next segment, we take a look at what is reported to be the most abused election law, the absentee ballot. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA-TV News. Every time Alabamians go to the polls, there are reports of fraud and abuse of state voting laws. Secretary of State Don Siegelman says absentee ballots are abused more than any other voting method. We received a complaint from Headland, Alabama, and Houston, uh, and just north of Dothan, um, that a particular candidate had, uh, had actually taken ballots out of the uh, city clerk's office and had gone around to... Uh, to homes and, and had, had encouraged those people to, to make, fill out an application and to fill out the ballot at the same time. The allegation, if it's true, is a violation of Alabama's election laws. There's hardly any way to police it so that they, it doesn't happen, but we did in this new election law, the absentee voting law, which was passed in the last session, uh, uh, legislative session, which is a good law increase the penalty from a misdemeanor to a felony. Siegelman says Alabama has a new law which should solve the potential for absentee ballot fraud, but he says it's not being followed because a lot of people don't understand it. In the, in the past, with absentee voting, the ballots were not counted until after the polls had closed. Under the new law, there will be a period of time beginning at 12 noon when candidates may have poll watchers present to observe a verification process whereby the, the absentee ballot itself is checked against a verification document to ensure that the person who allegedly cast it was a qualified elector in the precinct where he or she was supposed to be and that the, that the verification information was properly notarized or witnessed. And if it is not, the poll watchers who are present can challenge that ballot so that it would not be not, could not be legally counted. It's a, it's a safeguard that, that was built into the new election law, into the new absentee election law, which we hope will help prevent the fraudulent casting of absentee ballots. In our final report on election fraud, we'll look at some possible remedies to the problem. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA-TV News reporting. Secretary of State Don Siegelman says reports of election fraud are being investigated by his office and he's already turned some cases over to local district attorneys. And he adds that vigorous prosecution of violators is one deterrent to fraud. New laws and a purge of voting lists are other means of cleaning Alabama's election process. And Siegelman says that's one more important change that is needed in the state. One of the things that I'm particularly concerned with has nothing to do with cleaning up the voting list or absentee ballots, but it's something that I feel very strongly about, and that is that candidates and political committees who raise money and spend money on behalf of candidates or political issues have an obligation to the people of Alabama to disclose before the election where they are getting their money. Who is it that's supporting a particular candidate? I think the people, before they go into the voting booth, have a right to know where a candidate is getting his or her money before they vote for that candidate. And I think that should apply to the President of the United States, to the, to the, to the local offices as well. Right now, under Alabama law, candidates do not have to file a disclosure statement until 15 days after a primary or 30 days after the general election. What good does it do to find out 
after an election that a particular a candidate's being supported by a special interest. It, it does the voter no good at all. If the right to vote is our most precious right, then it seems to me that the right to cast an informed ballot is part of that right, a very integral part of that right. But yet our election laws work to keep the voters ignorant of some things, and one of those important things that I think all voters need to know is who is supporting a candidate and let them draw their own conclusions as to why and whether or not they want to vote for them at that point. At this point, there is a serious problem with election fraud and the potential for fraud. But several things will have to occur before the problem can be solved. First, prosecution of those caught violating the laws, and second, stronger laws in the areas of voting list maintenance and the reporting of campaign contributions. Until these steps are taken, the Secretary of State's office can only monitor the situation and try to get local DAs to prosecute. All this leaves a big question. How many elections are being stolen through the misuse of absentee ballots and fraudulent ballots being cast using the names of deceased people and voters who have long since moved away? This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA-TV News reporting. People calling the raw steel industry a lemon industry. I have a press release. I had this information from the media and that sort of thing. And uh, he started out with much more ID than I, uh, and with a 15-point lead in popularity, partly due to that ID. That that uh, ID gap has been narrowed or eliminated, and certainly the popularity gap, according to every poll I've seen, has been more than overtaken. I wish that I had another two months to run. I wish that he had accepted uh, invitations to debate me, really debate me, in such places as the Cum Cumberland School of Law, uh, because that's the only way you're going to be able to make an intelligent decision. And I, if I didn't believe I were many times more qualified than he, I wouldn't be running for this office. Indeed, if I didn't think I were going to be able to persuade many senators already there uh, to take a more realistic and informed point of view regarding some of the matters in which I am extremely well informed, I wouldn't be running, but I know I can. Govern peanuts, cotton, and milk. Now wake up Wednesday morning and hear that your Here's what's fixing to happen, in my opinion, on the county commission. You're going to have five people. You only got one man outside that city limits. There's only 704 square miles in the county. This man, if Cleve Johnson or Mr. Barfoot, which one I'm going to let, is going to represent 620 odd square miles. The rest of them are all here in the city, at least, you know, city limits. Uh, yes, I would certainly like to comfort all of my supporters. They've just been absolutely fantastic. They just continue to pray and call. My telephone lines have been burning up for the last two or three weeks, and I know many of them tried to get me, and uh, they couldn't because the line was busy. But I want everybody to take courage in the fact that for 25 years, I have known that God was going to do something very special gave me a vision 25 years ago, and that's the reason that y'all have never seen me cry. God's going to use it for good. Did you do anything special last night? Honey, I fed 44 people <laughs> twice yesterday, <laughs> but that's not special. That's normal at my house. How are you feeling this morning? Absolutely fantastic, the way I felt for 25 years. Ms. Ellen, how do you feel about spending Christmas in jail? Uh, well, that's okay. You know, if this can glorify God, this would be the greatest privilege I have ever had to go to jail. If it's going to glorify God, in some way it is. So that is just, that's fine. It'll just be a privilege. Flanked by family and supporters, Mrs. Allen entered the fourth floor jail receiving room shortly before 9 this morning. The 47-year-old former state treasurer told reporters that God had given her a vision 25 years ago that he was going to do something special. And that's the reason, quoting now, you have never seen me cry. When asked how she was feeling this morning, Mrs. Allen says she's doing fine. Absolutely fantastic, the way I felt for 25 years. 
Ms. Allen, how do you feel about spending Christmas in jail? Uh, well, that's okay. You know, if this can glorify God, this would be the greatest privilege I have ever had to go to jail. If it's going to glorify God, in some way it is. So that is just, that's fine. It'll just be a privilege. Will you put this in your book? Mrs. Allen says she plans to record her experience for a book she's writing while sharing the women's quarters with four inmates. After the six-month jail term, Mrs. Allen serves two and a half years on probation. Kim Davis, WSFA TV News at the Montgomery County Jail. It's a first for the Public Service Commission, which has had the code pending since last March. It prescribes standards of ethical conduct beyond the state's 1975 ethics law. It says no commissioner or employee shall solicit or accept anything of value from officers or employees of any PSC-regulated business entity. It's improper for any commissioner or employee, spouse or dependent children to directly or indirectly own stock or other interests in transportation or utility companies subject to the commission's jurisdiction. In addition to new ethical standards and those of the state law, there are seven general standards for commissioners and employees. These include improper discussion of pending matters before the commission, and suspected ethical violations are expected to be brought to the attention of the commission's legal division. PSE personnel may be subject to criminal penalties if they unethically solicit, accept, or agree to accept anything of value that might influence a vote or official action by the commission. George Mitchell, WSFA TV News. Before the commission meeting, Chairman Mac McKinney and Commissioner Cleavy Johnson argued about the proposed jail. McKinney has said the commission can fund the jail by passing a tax. Johnson says he won't vote for a tax unless the people vote for it. During the meeting, he told McKinney he thought $6 million in the building fund will solve the overcrowded jail problem. Mr. McKinney, I feel like that the $6 million we've got, we could correct the problem we have today. We're talking about 20 years. I said, I'm talking 20 about 20 years. Today. Look, 20 years. We have these people to study I'm 20 saying, years. Not, not tomorrow or the stop gas crap. I just say I feel like we can correct the problem. Well, I hear all these excuses. I don't ever hear nobody coming up with no solutions. That's what. Come up, put one up. Somebody shoot it down. McKinney asked Johnson what he would do if federal judge Robert Varner orders the commission to pass a tax and build the new jail to comply with federal guidelines. He reminded Johnson that every day the commission delays acting on the architect's proposal costs taxpayers six thousand dollars. Only Johnson voted against the resolution, which doesn't guarantee any action, but merely recommends to the new commission that it build a jail and courthouse on adjacent property as soon as suitable financing is found. Lisa Nielsen, WSFA TV News. Uh, I think in some ads across the state with, that were run, uh, it had been committed earlier, so we couldn't, we couldn't get reservations there, so we had to... No, no comment. I think there are many polls. Like some of my more prominent predecessors, such as Hill, Sparkman, Long, and Stennis, I'll be entering the Senate at an early enough age to eventually achieve committee chairmanship. Even at this, what I would call. Day. What was the intent of that? Uh series of letters, if it did in fact it was your letters that went out? Well, we've, you know, we've sent out many letters during the campaign to many different people all over the state. I could not name. They're trying to do with the Public Service Commission. Some people have told me that in Tennessee, we see what has happened in the Carolinas, and Florida, adverse to seeing all Republicans in state capital. I'd be adverse to seeing all. Now, there's one other problem I think that's involved, and that's the fact that the Public Service Commission has not exercised, either because it has not had the teeth that it needed to exercise full subpoena powers, or it has been lazy in, in exercising those full subpoena powers. At any rate, it has been far from what I would call desirable in getting all of the facts necessary to make reasonable and fair and equitable and balanced decisions. Democrats in Montgomery could vote the straight party ticket without any problem. The Republicans couldn't. One problem site was Capitol Heights. 
And we found that uh, at this particular precinct here at Capitol Heights that the straight Republican lever will not work on any of the voting machines. And we have checked this problem out and so far unable to determine why the straight lever will not pull. Dubina says Alabama Christian, Goodwin, and the City Auditorium are the other polling places where the problem existed. Dubina says he checked with county authorities, but no one seems to know who is in charge of such a problem. At this point, it's not known what effect, if any, this problem will have on the election here in Montgomery County. It's also unclear what the Republicans plan to do. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA TV News at Capitol Heights. I voted for Ronald Reagan. Why? Because he's the best president. Ronald Reagan? Why? Because um, cause he believes in God more than the president. President Carter, I mean, uh, Ronald Reagan. Why did you vote for Ronald Reagan? Because um, President Carter didn't keep his... But President... President Carter didn't give us promises. President Carter. Why? Because I like him. I vote for Anderson. Why? I just liked him. Okay. It was a slower than normal Tuesday at most of the state's liquor stores. At least that's what Chief of Stores Norman Guy says. Guy says apparently not all consumers have learned that the 1980 legislature repealed the law keeping liquor stores closed on election days. At that time, legislators were worried about unscrupulous persons buying votes with booze and about disturbances created by persons under the influence of alcohol. Guy says he's glad the law was repealed. It means more revenue for the state and less misunderstanding about store employees. He says customers used to think state store workers got an extra holiday on election day when actually their schedules were shifted during election week. Lisa Nielsen, WSFA TV News.